a number of reasons and factors that basically angered the Indians and you know became the trigger point of the revolt of 1857 as we know that the cartridges of the new Enfield rifle were rumored to be greased by uh, pig and cow fat that was of course opposed by the Muslim and the Hindu soldiers because that uh, uh, you know came at a clash with their religious ideas so this rumor became the final blow that triggered the revolt of 1857 in Barakpur on March 29th 1857 in the Bengal cantonment first we see the revolt taking place when they voiced when the soldiers voiced their opinions to not use these rifles and it was Mangal Pandey who rose to this occasion and attacked his fellow officer so of course he was taken captive and the other soldiers Indian soldiers also supported him in order to save himself from the trial he tried to shoot himself but Mangal Pandey was saved but not for long because he was taken to the trial and later he was you know hanged now we see that it was not just in Barakpur that the revolt was situated in and it did not end there in it was also in Meerut that the soldiers revolted against this usage of the Enfield rifles and there were certain soldiers who were taken captive uh, in this entire sort of chaos and rebellion that was created so what we see is these captives are now um, you know helped by the other soldiers who all together started to march to Delhi so let's look into that story so we see that in Merut in 9th May 1857, these soldiers are heading towards Delhi. So they have taken out the captive soldiers, Indian soldiers, and all of them are marching towards Delhi to take over Delhi and basically appeal to the then Mughal ruler Bahadur Shah II. So they appeal to Bahadur Shah II stating that, um, you know, he was to give them shelter and also lead the rebellion because they needed a figure that could lead this rebellion and basically drive out the British. So Bahadur Shah II took over Delhi, led the rebellion and also appealed to the other kingdoms and the kings to unite against the British colonizers so that they could drive them away. But soon Bahadur Shah II was taken and he was deported and this entire aspect of Bahadur Shah leading this rebellion failed. Now we see that this particular revolt was not uh, you know in reality led by Bahadur Shah because he was a nominal head he did not have real powers it was Bakht Khan who was the real leader of the revolt at Delhi. So he helped in capturing Delhi. But soon we see that British recaptured Delhi in September 1857 when they had already deported Bahadur Shah II. So they deported Bahadur Shah to Rangoon and he died there in 1862 after which Delhi again became the British portion after which the British took over Delhi and it became their portion again so we see that the revolt was not as we have discussed centered around any specific area so it was not Delhi which became the epicenter per se the other areas were also rising in rebellion so the first of course was Kanpur where if you remember Nana Saheb was leading the revolt because Nana Saheb's territory had been taken away because he was the adopted son of Peshwa Bajirao too owing to the doctrine of lapse that was advised by uh, Lord Dalhousie after which Nana Saheb did not have uh, his estate anymore so Nana Saheb uh, you know was supported by Tantia Tope and Azimullah Khan who led the revolt in Kanpur 
though these people gave a good fight to the british colonizers the british soon again recaptured kanpur in 18 57 so we see that nana saheb was not really successful in his attempt of the rebellion after the british captured kanpur in 1857 nana saheb fled to nepal whereas tatia top and azimullah khan were executed by the british now lucknow was also one of the most important centers that rose in this uh, you know uprising we see that Begum Hazrat Mahal is the one who is who led the way for this rebellion in Lucknow. Begum Hazrat Mahal was Wajid Ali Shah's wife. Who was Wajid Ali Shah? If you remember, Awadh was taken by the British with the subsidiary alliance that Wajid Ali had signed, and Wajid Ali Shah was deported to Bengal. And this was something that angered the Begum. Now, Lucknow, which was the capital of Awadh, was uh, you know taken by Begum, and she led the revolt from there. She was supported in her attempt by Maulvi. Ahmadullah Shah who was from Faizabad so we see that though Begum Hazrat Mahal really led the way for the revolt in Lucknow the british captured lucknow in march 1858 begum hazrat mahal with the help of her supporters fled to nepal but maulvi ahmadullah shah was there and he kept fighting till the point he was assassinated So can you tell me who led the revolt in Lucknow was it Nana Saheb Wajid Ali Shah Begum Hazrat Mahal or Mangal Pandey the correct answer is Begum Hazrat Mahal another important center of the revolt was Ara and this revolt was led by Kuwar Singh of Jagdishpur so this was an area in Bihar where the revolt rose from we see that kuwar singh successfully freed parts of bihar from the british domination but the british captured the lost territories very well in april 1858 bareilly was also a portion that rose in rebellion and this was done under khan bahadur khan after khan bahadur khan was taken into captivity we see that british recaptured bareilly as well in 1858 the most important center of the entire rebellion was jhansi and we all know why it became so famous because it was led by rani lakshmi bai now rani lakshmi bai who was acting as the regent for her son who was adopted had to give her territory give her kingdom away because she fell prey to the doctrine of lapse that was brought by lord dalousi now the important and the most interesting factor here is that rani lakshmi bai was the only woman to lead an entire revolt against the british in 1857 rebellion so what happened is after delhi jhansi became the mo most important regional center of the uprising in 1857 so we see that jhansi had fallen victim to the doctrine of lapse by lord dalhousi because of her adopted son who was denied of his right to the throne so as you saw that the british were reclaiming a lot of the areas and the british was doing so by the newer regiments that were uh, you know taken for example the sikh regiments of the punjab right now when um you know other regiments were basically being used to recapture these places we see that uh, the chief of sindhya the maratha chief was also uh, somebody who was being used to recapture these places now rani lakshmi bai successfully drove out the maratha chief sindhya and captured gwalior but after a point of time when rani lakshmi bai died in june 
the british recaptured gwalior and rani lakshmi bai was leading her fight was leading her revolt with the help of tatia top now after this entire incident happened the revolt of 1857 happened of course we can understand that this revolt that arose out of the anger of the indians was of course suppressed by the british brutally but it was not just brutal suppression that happened after the revolt of 1857 there were certain laws that were passed by the british government post the revolt of 1857 because they realized that the indians had the capacity to revolt and it was necessary for them to devise laws against such a case so we see that lord canning who was the governor general of india devised a proclamation what was the proclamation in july 1858 the rebellion was completely suppressed by the british but in this particular pro proclamation we see that all the rebels were pardoned except those who had been found guilty of killing british officials so other than that everybody was to let go off who were associated to this rebellion now we can understand that the rebellion was of course not a victory in the part of the indians because the indians could not uh, win for a lot of factors for a lot of reasons and the stronghold that the british had was really difficult to overthrow so what were the factors what were the reasons behind this failure so the first reason was an overall lack of unity so we see that the british had an all encompassing army so they were a united front uh, compared to the indian who were rising in small rebellions from small kingdoms they were not a nation they were not under one common leader as well so that was lacking in the part of the indians we see that the revolt was highly localized it was small local areas that rose to rebellion and not really large groups that attacked the british per se the next factor was that the most important british centers like bengal madras bombay did not participate in the revolt so these were the strongholds of the british these were the places from where the british actually wanted to start administering the entire uh, you know the political place that was uh, the colony now these places did not specifically rise in revolt and they did not have to manage these centers which were not only important to the british politically but also economically so you see the places that rose in revolt were easy for british to crush then we see that the rebels used outdated war techniques and the leaders lacked coordination planning among themselves so the the factor that the techniques that the army who rose in rebellion was using were all older techniques now the british had a uh, far more cumbersome techniques which was you know the muskets the gunpowder the rifles of course like we saw so all these techniques were at the disposal of the british whereas these people the indian masses were using whatever came in front of them and they in fact did not know the usage of newer war techniques or did not have these things at their disposal some regional groups and rulers provided active support to the british so like we saw that newer regiments were being appointed that of the six um the you know the sind ruler and other people as well who supported the british coming and the british establishing their control over india so they supported the british in the revolt itself so we could see a peculiar picture where the indians are fighting the indians almost because the army that was fighting the revolt under the british of course was the people taken from the indian masses itself the intellectual class abstained from lending a support to the rebellion 
now the intellectual western educated classes that understood the fact that these people uh, you know the colonizers the british who had come from outside were modernizing india and they supported this modernization so of course they did not really want to go out of their way and cause a rebellion against the british that would affect the british in a way that they would have to leave that factor of modernization so you see a lot of uh, western educated uh, higher class people were in fact supporting the colonizers last we see that the revolt suffered greatly due to the absence of a strong leader who could fuse the scattered elements into a consolidated force yes bahadur shah the second tried to do so but bahadur shah the second as we discussed was only a nominated head and all the leaders all the faces that we discussed about were all regional leaders one unified idea of india did not exist at the moment the british started to govern the british started to move into politics so you see how um, Uh, you know very interestingly in fact the british had devised their place where all these um, you know smaller kingdoms even if they would unite with each other could not agree to the terms of who could lead the way in front of the british so till now we have seen the factors that you know caused the indians to not win a victory against the british but we have to understand that the british colonizers were already prepared for something uh, like this because they had the tools with which they did colonize and they also had the tools with which they were to crush this rebellion so we see the reasons for the british victory first is of course the communication system the railways which allowed british to travel quickly from one place to another so imagine a rebellion that broke out in uh, uh, delhi and the troops were being sent from bengal so that was only possible because of the fast communication system that british had already developed the second was services of capable generals helped the british win so like i stated the fact that it was a peculiar picture of the indian soldiers uh, you know killing and massacring the indian soldiers so it was the indian able bodied generals that helped the british win but it was not just the military generals per se it was also the governing generals who helped the british devise certain military laws which could uh, help with curbing the rebellion of 1857 we see henry havelock james outram henry lawrence who devised some laws which could help the british combat the revol revolt of 1857 that was arising in various areas we have seen how expansive the revolt of 1857 was so we can understand that this had shaken the british colonizing idea and also the idea of the british colonizers to rule india so you can very well understand the fact that there were repercussions or there were certain impacts of this revolt of 1857 the first impact was that the rule of english east india company was replaced by the rule of the british crown under the queen victoria so we see queen victoria becoming the empress of india so all powers now lay in the hands of the crown and not the english east india company second the idea of a governor general was disposed of so it was a viceroy who would be situated under the queen who would uh, you know take to the indirect administration where queen would be leading from england so we see that lord canning who was the the then governor general became the last governor general of india and the first viceroy of india 
Lord Canning became the first viceroy under the Queen, and under the viceroy was a secretary of state. A secretary of state was appointed to report directly to the crown. The viceroy would work under his supervision. So basically, the state secretary was even more important than the viceroy because the state secretary would directly report everything to the queen. The second aspect that we come to is the fact that, you know, something like a revolt of 1857 had shaken the grounds of the British colonizing attitude to an extent where they were now considering to revamp their policies. And the first thing that, we, that they did was to rearrange the military order that they had. So reorganization of the British Indian Army. The proportion of the English soldiers in the army was increased. Of course, they could not anymore trust the Indians because they had uh, rose up in a rebellion against the British. All strategic military positions and essential equipments were to be placed under them. So Indians were not to be given too many equipments under them lest they rebel again. More soldiers were recruited from areas which remained neutral or supported the British during 1857 rebellion. So till now, by now we have seen the fact that there were areas that had risen in rebellion and then there were areas which were not affected by revolt of 1857 and certain areas that had supported the British itself. So what the British exactly did was where the rebellion did not uh, really affect they were taking new soldiers from there. So this was the point of time when British started to devise the plan of divide and rule. This idea of divide and rule was carried further more when they focused on not allowing the Muslims and the Hindus to unite so that there would not be any sort of rebellion against the British from a united front. Interestingly enough, we saw that the Rajputs, the Sikhs, the Marathas had supported the British itself. They, were, they, they weren't exactly involved in the rebellion, but also they did not uh, directly, in fact, support the British. Certain remained neutral and certain were, of course, supporting the British in order to crush the rebellion itself. But the revolt of 1857 did not only happen because of military reasons. It did not only happen because of the soldiers. It also happened because the kings, the samandars, the landlords were all really angered by the British policies that uh, they had devised. So the first thing that the queen did was to discontinue the doctrine of lapse. So we see the policy of doctrine of lapse were to, were to be discontinued and no further territorial expansion would take place. So the annexation was to be stopped and doctrine of lapse was also made to go out of order. The Zamindas were awarded with honorific titles and increased their share of land revenue. So now we see that the queen is devising more power in the hands of local people, the local Zamindars. So the Zamindars now could increase their share in the land revenue and much more power was given to them than that existed before. No further interference in socio-religious matters would take place. So the queen essentially focused on the point that because they were, you know, rulers, because they were the ones who were governing India and they were foreigners, they would not anymore interfere in the social and religious aspects in the country. That was only to be handled by the indigenous people. And that was done so because 
uh, of uh, you know how the indians had reacted to various policies and various acts that was passed in favor of the changes of social evils and practices in india so this entire uh, event of the great uprising of 1857 has very uh, differently been observed by the historians some want to call it the first war of independence some say that it wasn't really a war of independence per se some state that it was a sepoy mutiny so that idea is established by agp tyler who is a british historian and states that it was called the sepoy mutiny and that is what states the entire uh, sort of event per se when we look at it from the perspective of an outsider and also look at it in a holistic sense whereas vd savarkar states that it is to be called the first war of independence because this was the first time that the indians rose to uh, you know a war like situation and they wanted uh, to fight the britishers so that the british would leave their country but agb tyler stated that it was sepoy mutiny because it was the soldiers who had driven this revolt but the modern historians like that of irfan habib as well as the nationalistic historians are more likely to stick to the term of the great rebellion or the revolt or the uprising of 1857 the modern and the nationalist historians take to these terms because they state that uh, you know these were um, revolting activities and they uh, in in the sense was not only surrounded by sepoys right it was not just the soldiers that took to the rebellion it was also the normal class people the zamindars the higher classes and in fact everybody who could go into a rebellion they did rise to the occasion and do the revolt of 1857 now uh you know these modern historians have al also stated the fact that these uh, did not have a nationalistic sense per se in fact so they can't be called as the first war of independence because the idea of an entire nation was not there because like we saw that in fact they did not have one leader to lead them so they have stated the term a great rebellion or the uprising of 1857 because like the other uprising these were very very regional whereas you know vidi savarkar and people have stated that it was not just the sepoys but it was a first war of independence because that came as the first time when india or the masses decided to stand up and voice their opinions to revolt against the colonizers domination so as we saw these were the socio religious economic and various political causes also that triggered the revolt of 1857 and created the course of war in such a way that it not only shook the british colonizers but also changed the structure in which they chose to govern their most prized possession that was india Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology, get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly, learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step learning is not just fun and easy it is rewarding too so register for free now